Um, our third award for outstanding clinical research is the Qual College's own award for the research paper of the year. And this goes to Dr. Eleanor Barry, a GP in North London and DPhil student at the University of Oxford. Ellie won this award for her paper about screen and treat policies for type 2 diabetes. Now, I could read you the full title, but better to have it come from Ellie and described in her own words. Please, could you all put your hands together and welcome to the stage our research paper of the year winner, Dr. Ellie Barry. Um, so I'm just waiting for my slides. But while I'm waiting for that, I'd just like to say, uh, oh, there they are. Uh, a special thanks to the RCGP for this award. We are absolutely delighted to be recognised in this way. And it's such a privilege to be awarded um, such a huge prize. So that, that is quite a long title, I completely agree. But in summary, we were tasked by policymakers, clinicians and patients to review the vast amount of literature assessing the diagnostic accuracy of tests used to identify those at most risk of diabetes and also to assess the effectiveness of interventions aimed at those who are diagnosed with prediabetes and their transferability to a real world setting. So I don't have any financial interest to declare. So I just want to give you a little bit of a context about the setting this research took place. So Newham is a deprived area in East London. About a third of children are living in poverty. It's got one of the highest overcrowded rates um, of housing in the country the highest concentration of chicken shops and uh, East Ham High Street has one of the highest um, number of betting shops in the country. But it was home to the 2012 Olympics and has had quite a lot of reinvestment in the area. So one of the reasons we did this research is because of the confusion about how to identify those at most risk. Each of the international criteria recommend a different test, they recommend different cutoffs, and clinicians and GPs were already identifying these different groups and really wondering about what to do with them. So I'm just giving the headlines um, of this systematic review because it synthesized almost 100 papers. But what we found is that the different tests weren't very good at identifying each other's abnormalities. For example, the HbA1c only correctly identified about 50% of people who would have traditionally been diagnosed as pre-diabetic uh, or have impaired glucose tolerance as by the oral glucose tolerance standard. And actually, when we looked at different kinds of studies, the epidemiological studies, we showed that there was very, very limited overlap in who was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. So each test identifies a different group of pre-diabetic population. The other thing to note is that where your cutoffs are also has a big impact on how many people are identified as at risk. So this Venn diagram shows that with all three circles, about 27% of a UK population would be diagnosed as having prediabetes. But actually, if you then put in the ADA criteria, the number of pre-diabetics almost doubles to 50%. And so that has huge commissioning implications and isn't really a great way of identifying those who are hottest and really on the brink of developing diabetes. So this just summarizes what I've said. And I'd probably just like to point out at this point that it doesn't mean each test is bad. Each test identifies a different underlying disease process which eventually leads to diabetes. But what we did identify is that there was a big impact on which diagnostic characteristics you use, um, and different people would be identified as pre-diabetic, depending on which, um, which, which test is identified. So once you've got your at-risk population, we now have the National Diabetes Prevention Programme, and lots of areas have diabetes prevention strategies. And trials did show that you can reduce your risk of developing diabetes, if you fully engage with interventions and complete these. But there were huge variations in the intensity and length of interventions. And many of these would just not be feasible in a real world setting. And the other thing was looking at the, the attrition and withdrawal rates in trials. So as you can see, we're all identifying a big pre-diabetic population, but not many people get to the end and complete these interventions. So if you're, if you're left a little bit confused and a bit frazzled about what to do with your patient who has a HbA1c of 44 in front of you, 
what, we, what our main messages are is that these test results need to be interpreted within the context of the individual, looking at their risk factors for developing diabetes. In particular, do they have underlying cardiovascular risk factors, a family history, do they fulfill the obesity categories, are they from a high risk ethnicity, and in particular, is this a person that's had gestational diabetes in pregnancy? This is a really hot group. About 70% of these women develop diabetes within 10 years of their pregnancy diagnosis. But they may have normal blood tests at their six-week postnatal check. And um, just finishing up now, when we're talking about behaviour change with our patients, it's really, it's really crucial to do this in partnership within the social context of the patient's lives. Do they have a social support at home which can enable the lifestyle change? Do they have access to healthy food options? Are interventions such as exercise, are they culturally appropriate to them? Do they have access to safe um, green spaces where you can go and exercise and have this integrated into your daily life? Do they have adequate health literacy? Not just to understand what's being told um, within the interventions, but in everyday life when you're walking around a supermarket or walking around a shop, to understand the different health information that's being given on different food packaging. And crucially, people do need to have the financial support to enable and continue these lifestyle changes. So it is with many thanks um, to the NIHR for continuing to fund myself and Trish Greenhouse, who's overall super academic supervisor, and a special thanks to Newham CCG and the clinicians at Newham for their ongoing support of this academic research. Um, Ellie, I, I mean, what I really like about systematic reviews and meta-analysis is they cleverly bring together a wealth of research and condense it into practical, usable data to help us in our work as GPs. You've done a huge amount of work, 100 papers. Thank you for reading them for us. Um, so um, what, what, what does this mean for GPs in their daily work? What will I, what will I might do differently on Monday? Well, I think at the moment um, we're set up to follow quite strict protocols. So you have somebody that is at, has an elevated HPRNC, they get a diagnosis on EMIS, and then they're sent a letter or given a telephone call to go to a prevention program. Mm. And I think there just needs to be a bit more awareness about the context into which this abnormal test is interpreted within the individual. So to the tests as they stand don't identify the top one or two percent. We really want to invest the intensive lifestyle interventions too. So the people who are at most risk are the ones who have all of those underlying risk factors to progress to diabetes. So is this another example where GPs have to share uncertainty with patients because some, some patients are going to be falsely reassured they don't have pre-diabetes and others are actually going to be if you like, given the, uh, the diagnosis and maybe will never develop uh, diabetes. Yeah, that's right. If I take you back to if the Venn diagram, um, sorry, I can spend more time going through it. I could speak about it all day, but um, you could have a normal HbA1c and still fit into the other uh, categories. You could have an impaired fasting glucose or an impaired glucose tolerance and be told that actually you're not quite on the progression yet to diabetes. And it means that you may not have access to those um, messages and interventions which may help you reduce your risk. Right, okay. And for those sceptics out there, they might say this is disease-mongering, so at the very low end of the spectrum. Is there any truth in that? Do you think that we're giving people a diagnosis when they don't really have a pathological condition as such? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. I think it's about balance. I think if you have somebody who has an elevated HbA1c but has multiple morbidities, um, is elderly, is frail, it would be completely, um, it could be, would not be appropriate to, um, to really stress the importance of diabetes prevention to them if there's so many other medical conditions going on. I think we do have to be aware of overdiagnosis and what the role of these tests are. Um, if you did lower the diagnostic criteria to the ADA criteria, what, I don't see what the point of identifying half the population mm -hmm. as at risk are. That's not really what we want from this t these tests. We want to identify those who are uh, on the brink of developing diabetes so we can intervene at those times. Fantastic. My last question. Uh, you've done incredibly well so early in your academic career. Can I, can I ask you, how did you get into research? 
Well, um, I was very, very fortunate to be um, to have an academic add-on to my GP training program, um, and I did an academic year um, with Trish Greenhow, which led on to an NIHR in practice fellowship, uh, where I did a master's in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and then have been very, very fortunate to be awarded a doctoral research fellowship so I can carry on um, exploring diabetes prevention in Newham. I don't think it's because you're fortunate. I think it's because you're amazing. So thank you so much. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a photo and we'll let you go. <laughs>